Can you, uh... Thank you. I wonder if these lights shining on the screen can be turned off, possibly. So, uh, uh, I, uh, I thank you. I, uh, when I came over here, uh, someone asked me what time was the Eight Bells lecture, which I think is like asking <laughs> what color was Napoleon's white horse or something like that. But. Put yourself back to uh, 1020 AM, June 4th, 1942. The, um, the mobile force of the first air fleet, the same force that had six months earlier attacked Pearl Harbor with deadly results, was bearing down on the island of Midway. Midway was, uh, as by its name, the, in the middle of the Pacific, it was the gateway to Pearl Harbor and the U.S. fleet there. And the uh, Japanese fleet was bearing down on it. They had already attacked it with aircraft and created quite a bit of havoc on the island. And they were getting ready to uh, launch a second attack on the island. And at the same time, Admiral Nagumo, in charge of the Japanese fleet, was looking out for the American fleet. The Americans had already been fighting back. All morning, aircraft from Midway Island had been attacking the Japanese. Uh, some 67 aircraft from Midway had attacked in, in different waves, and none of them, whether they were dive bombers, torpedo bombers, B-24s, or uh, B-17s overhead, scored any hits. Admiral Fletcher, who was commanding the three American carriers that were poised to defend Midway, had also been attacking, and he had sent 151 attack aircraft against the fleet that morning. Of those 151, by 10.20 a.m., all but 13 of them had either been shot down, had expended their weapons, or were lost. Those 13, and, and it had scored no hits, those 13 aircraft were attacking one of Nagumo's four ships, the Soryu. Now, Regardless of the outcome of that attack, how successful or otherwise, only one Japanese aircraft carrier would have been damaged or sunk, leaving the other three poised and ready to attack Fletcher's fleet, and, and Nagumo knew where the Americans were. So he was ready to strike back, and that was the situation at 10.20 a.m. on June 4, 1942. Now, many of you here are probably very familiar with the Battle of Midway, um, and I won't assume that, so bear with me. Um, and those of you that have heard many lectures about it, also uh, I hope I'll be able to tell you something that you haven't heard before, because my focus of, of my story and my book is on the submarine Nautilus. But a little bit of background first. The Japanese, by the first six months since Pearl Harbor, and of course they have been at war for some time before that, had accomplished most of their objectives already of, of their uh, conflict in World War II. They wanted to take over the exclusive, ec the, what they called their exclusive economic zone uh, and um, also oust all the colonial powers that they felt were uh, imposing on them. And they had done that. They had taken Malaysia, Singapore had fallen, Hong Kong had fallen, um, Manila w had fallen, and, and by, uh, by June, so had uh, Bataan, and the Americans had been kicked out of the Philippines. They had uh, attacked New Guinea, had even made a raid on Darwin in Australia, killing several hundred people, uh, a carrier attack. They had also occupied American islands, held islands in the, in the Central Pacific, including Guam and Wake. About the only uh, setbacks they had experienced up to that point uh, was uh, Jimmy Doolittle's raid on Tokyo in uh, April of 1942, which really caught them by surprise, but was not a, a huge uh, operation in terms of its damage to the Japanese homeland, but certainly psychologically was, was massive. And also the Battle of the Coral Sea, which was in May. At the Coral Sea, uh, most historians uh, argue that that was a standstill, a stalemate. Uh, in that battle, uh, the Americans lost the carrier Lexington, and the Japanese lost a light carrier, plus two of their other carriers were damaged, as was the uh, Yorktown of the U.S. But the, uh, the invasion that they were planning to make was halted. 
But other than that, the Japanese were really on quite of a roll and had, had, had control over most of the Pacific uh, west of Midway. So the next step was to attack Midway Island. This is a, a, a model of the six ships that attacked Pearl Harbor. The four on the left, the Akagi, Kaga, Soryu, and Hiryu were at Midway. The other two, Shokaku and Zuikaku, were, were damaged at Coral Sea. Actually, one was damaged and the other lost all of its aircraft, so they were both out of action. This model, by the way, is, uh, is, is, a, is a pretty uh, intricate and detailed set of models, and what makes it more remarkable is that they're miniature models. Uh, I've seen another picture where there's a quarter laid over two of these flight decks. They're, they're very tiny. And, and of course, you, you never saw the four ships lined up like that. This is a, a, a vintage photo of one of the ships, the Kaga, uh, in 1928. Kaga was uh, actually built on a battleship hull, and uh, they were converting some of their capital ships to carriers uh, at the beginning, before the war started. Here's another photo of, of that ship. They, in, 1937, in, 1930, in 1937, they actually extended the flight deck to cover the whole front of the ship and it became a full-size carrier. This is a photo of Akagi, the flagship, taken from the tail gunner of an aircraft that's just launched. Some of you have seen these pictures before, maybe. And here is the uh, Hiryu and the Soryu look very similar. Uh, they, uh, these four carriers together sported uh, 264 attack aircraft which they were uh, hoping to use to neutralize the forces on Midway Island as well as be able to sink the American carriers when they sortied. Now opposing the carriers were two forces of note. One was uh, the Admiral Fletcher's three aircraft carriers, ba basically all we had, the Yorktown, um, the Hornet, and the Enterprise. Uh, the Yorktown had been repaired from its uh, several weeks earlier battle at uh, Coral Sea and was back in action. And they, thanks to our intelligence services, they were in position to defend Midway from attack. But the other force that was instrumental in this battle were the submarines. This is a photo of the submarine Nautilus, actually shortly before uh, the Battle of Midway in April 1942. Nautilus was a, an old ship. It was built in the 30s. It was actually built before naval treaties reduced the size of submarines, so it was quite large. It was a 4,000 ton ship, 370 feet long, and it, and, and it sported these huge 8 inch caliber, I'm sorry, 6 inch caliber deck guns, which were the size that one would normally find on cruisers. In fact, it was called a cruiser sub. Uh, Nautilus was on its first war patrol and none of the 94 men on board had ever been in battle before. But they were led by uh, Captain Bill Brockman, who was, as it turns out, one of the top submarine commanders of the war. Here's a, a, a photo of the Nautilus sister ship, the Narwhal, which looks identical. I don't really have a, a, a great shot like this of the Nautilus, but that gives you an idea that it was a pretty big ship. Most submarines in those days were, you know, on the order of a thousand tons or less. The Japanese built some large ones in the 2,500 ton range and even later some bigger ones, but Nautilus was, was huge. And uh, I don't expect you to, to read this, but just to give you an idea that in spite of its size, you'd think something that's more than a football field long and four stories high would, would be uh, rather roomy, but the inside was crammed with equipment uh, weapons, storage, and, and tanks. And really, when you kind of break it down and look at the compartments inside and inside the pressure hall, the yellow area represents the, the living space for, for the 94 men that, that were in that ship. I calculated that area to be approximately the size of a four-bedroom house. So if you can imagine 94 people living in your house for four weeks, six weeks, eight weeks at a time, uh, and of course they had to store all their gear and a lot of their supplies in that room with them. The um, orange 
part in the top is what in World War II was called the conning tower. In World War II submarines, the main pressure hull w had, had the, most of the equipment and weapons and propulsion, but in order to have, uh, allow the captain to see farther and have his periscope up higher, they put a compartment above the main pressure hull connected by a hatch and a ladder where the main attack center was and that was also pressurized so it could be occupied when submerged and that conning tower was about 18 feet long and about 8 feet diameter and it included sonar gear, uh, uh, two periscopes, uh, attack uh, computers, uh, radio, uh, other equipment and uh, 11 men lived and worked in that space for the day of the Battle of Midway. Uh, I was fortunate in working on this story and researching this background to be able to speak with uh, a fellow by the name of Buzz Lee who was a uh, second class radioman on the Nautilus during the Battle of Midway. And in those days there were no sonarmen, there was no one that had that designation, but he was specifically trained to operate sonars. And the chief sonarman, who normally would have been in that conning tower at battle stations, was sick. He had dysentery. And that required regular visits to the head. And because the captain didn't want, obviously, the sonar to be unoccupied at any time, he had Buzz bring up a little folding chair and sit next to uh, his boss and man the sonar. So Buzz Lee said he had the headphones on his ears the entire day of the Battle of Midway and told us what it was like. And I'll get a little bit to that in a minute. Now why is Nautilus important? Well, the submarines were there in kind of a picket line. They were meant to be one of the early warning uh, uh, opportunities for, for us to know exactly where the fleet was coming from and if net possible to attack it and do damage. The submariners were told to monitor or guard the radio transmissions from the search aircraft that morning, uh, I believe at, uh, uh, at 7 a.m., 0700. Now, Bill Brockman was not one to be limited by his orders. And he, he realized that the search aircraft would probably be launching at dawn, which was around 4.30 a.m. at that place and time. And so he had his, um, uh, he came up to, to periscope depth, put his antenna up and listened right away and he was the first to know of all the submariners about the approach of the Japanese and was able to put himself in position to intercept them. The only submarine that was able to do so. So Bill Brockman and the Nautilus found themselves smack dab in the middle of the Japanese fleet with the four aircraft carriers, battleships, cruisers and destroyers um, and uh, at 8.24 a.m. he wrote in his diary uh, the following entry, which I'm going to read to you because I think it's a pretty, it's a pretty descriptive little, little uh, uh, paragraph. He says, the picture presented on raising the periscope was one never experienced in peacetime practices. Ships were on all sides moving across the field at high speed and circling away to avoid the submarine's position. Ranges were above 3,000 yards. The Jinsu cruiser had passed over and was now astern. The battleship was on our port bow and firing her whole broadside at the battery, a battery at the periscope. Flag hoists were being made, searchlights were trained at the periscope. The exact position of the Nautilus may have been known by the enemy at this time because number nine deck torpedo was running hot in the tube as a result of shearing of the torpedo retaining pin during depth charging. So Nautilus was a busy submarine at that point in time. Bill Brockman's job was to try to cause what damage he could to the, to the Japanese fleet. And he did fire several torpedoes that day. Uh, sadly, the uh, American torpedoes at that time of the war were not very effective, and none of them seems to have caused any damage. But nonetheless, their presence there caused quite a bit of disruption to, to the Japanese. Among the ships that were uh, attacking Brockman and his submarine was the Arashi. This is a picture of Arashi, a destroyer. The destroyers were the main threat to submarines because not only did they have sonars which could detect them, but they carried depth charges which was the main weapon against a submarine. Now as part of this uh, project, 
I, I took an interest in, in that because Buzz Lee told me what it was like to experience depth charging. Nautilus withstood 42 depth charges that day. Um, and I did a little bit of research besides his, his personal impressions. And it turns out there were a number of, of uh, studies done, including actually putting microphones into submarines and exploding depth charges at different distances to record what it sounded like inside the ship. And you can actually, in, in my book, I mention a website where you can go and listen to this. When a depth charge explodes, this is, a, this is a, a, an explosive that's dropped with a pressure switch so at a certain depth it will explode. It basically creates a bubble of gas in the water. And, and there's millions of pounds per square inch of pressure created when this explodes. Now, that sudden displacement of the, of the water creates what's called a shock wave. That shock wave travels faster than the speed of sound and carries quite a bit of energy with it. When that shock wave hits the metal hull of the submarine, it's a very sharp pulse of energy and it makes a click or a metallic ping when it hits the hull. And some of you who have read about or maybe seen movies of, from World War II have heard about this click that, that submariners would hear before they heard the explosion of the depth charge. I always kind of thought it was a trigger or something, but it turns out it's the shock wave. And shortly thereafter would come the reverberation of the actual explosion. So it's kind of like uh, if you see lightning, it gets the, the light from it gets to you before the thunder. And of course, the farther away you are from that depth charge, the longer time between the click and the boom. And so uh, submariners that didn't hear the click probably didn't return to tell about it because the boom was too close. Um, so that <coughs> um, pressure, that shock wave could in itself cause damage. But the next thing that came was the reverberation from the explosion itself that would travel at the speed of sound. And the, that would be transmitted into the hull and it would, of course, it would affect any of the equipment or the crew inside. And the bubble would then collapse and rebound, creating sometimes two or three reverberations. Inside the ship, everything would rattle and maybe, you know, fall and, and break and depending on how close. If it was close enough, the hull could actually rupture. But if it was far enough away, then it would be horrifyingly uh, you know, disruptive to your insides and uh, to hear Buzz describe it was, was harrowing. Pressures would go up to 130 pounds per square inch inside the ship. And sailors actually reported seeing jets of gas that would fly through the air. And what was determined from physiological studies, what they were actually were seeing was fluid moving through the retina that was disturbed by the by this impulse of, of pressure. Um, Buzz Lee, I have a few quotes from Buzz in the book about this. Uh, of course, one of the the safety, uh, the way to escape a depth charge was to go deeper than the depth charge would explode. That would help. That would get you some distance from it. But and and the Nautilus was able to, to dive to 300 foot depth. But they often went deeper in depth charging. Buzz Lee said, we didn't give a damn how deep we went. I thought I was going to die. I thought it was the end. He said there was nothing to be done, there was nowhere to turn, and there was no way to help a shipmate through the ordeal. It didn't help to see the fear in another man's eyes. You just, you didn't look at anybody else. You just held on and sat there. What are you going to do? You're helpless. So they just had to wait and listen to the clicks and the booms until it was over. Uh, 52 American submarines were lost during World War II. And in fact, one, one statistic I, I like to quote uh, is that the American submarine fleet, which comprised 2% of the Navy, uh, was responsible for 50, uh, over 50% of Japanese war losses uh, shipping. However, it was at a cost. They lost 20% of their uh, uh, submariners were lost during the war, 3,500 crew. And that was the largest attrition of any force in the U.S. Uh, military. 52 submarines were lost during the war. Uh, 50 uh, 
of those were in the Pacific. 22 of those were sunk by attacking destroyers with depth charges. Now, one of the safety uh, measures, as I said, was to go deep. And this worked very well in the beginning of the war because the Japanese depth charges were set to go off at a fairly shallow depth, um, uh, uh, 50 or 100 feet. So if you went to 300 feet, you could, you could kind of get it deep enough underneath that unless it was right on top of you, you might be okay. And this was a, was a ta tactic that submariners used early in the war. Well, there was a congressman by the name of Andrew May who went to the war zone on kind of a fact-finding tour. And he learned of this information. And, and he felt that that would be kind of a keen thing to report back to his constituents. So he held a press conference. Mm -hmm. um. Well, as you can imagine, within a few months, the Japanese were, had, had uh, modified their depth charges to explode deeper. Uh, and of the 22 submarines that were sunk by depth charging, as many as 10 with a loss of 800 crew uh, were probably because of Andrew May's disclosure. Now, you'll be sorry to hear that he was never prosecuted for this breach of security, but he did go to federal prison for um, bribery and war profiteering. <laughs> now, so what does the Nautilus have to do with this? Well, this is a complicated drawing, and I'm just going to focus on a couple of things on it. As I said, at 10.20 a.m. on that day, all but 13 of the American planes were either shot down, um, had expended their weapons, or were lost. And in fact, among the, the, the most heroic uh, and, and famous of those aircraft were the torpedo squadrons. Uh, we like to talk about a force being decimated, and I think that term is used kind of lightly. In the case of the torpedo squadrons, it's quite accurate because 40 of 43 planes were shot down. So one in, fewer than one in 10 actually survived and none of them were able to score hits. However, there was another force of 33 planes that was lost but they weren't out of action. They still had their weapons and they were still searching. That was led by an uh, aviator by the name of Max Leslie and he was from the Enterprise. And his 33 dive bombers had gone, the, the, the orange circle is where the Japanese fleet was, he had gone past it turned to the right and, and was flying south of the fleet and was, without any other information, probably never going to find them. But the Nautilus was there, having been depth charged by the Arashi, and the Arashi was called back to the fleet to rejoin them and decided to make a beeline in a straight direction for the fleet. Leslie saw the Arashi and he decided to line up his 33 planes with the wake and see where it took him and within minutes he reported seeing the Japanese ships. So I'd like to credit the Nautilus for being aggressive, being at the right place at the right time and pressing on their attacks that caused Leslie to have some chance of finding the Japanese. What happened after that is, uh, is, is, a, is an amazing piece of history. The, I, I like to say, many people say that Americans were lucky in this battle, and, and I guess there's one case where I would agree. For the most part, I think, as I'll argue in the book, it was less about luck than it was about uh, relentless and persistent and brave attacks by our pilots and our submarines against the fleet that carried the day. But the one bit of luck was that after flying all around like he did, uh, Les uh, uh, McCluskey, I may have said Leslie, McCluskey and his 33 dive bombers arrived at the location of the fleet within the minute that Leslie and his 13 bombers arrived coming from the other direction. So as a result, those 33 targeted two of the other three ships and within the next four minutes, three of the Japanese carriers were on their way to the bottom. Uh, here's a vintage photo of a uh, dauntless dive bomber that uh, McCluskey and Leslie were flying. This uh, particular shot is from an attack on the uh, on the cruise on a couple of cruisers that were caught the next day the Mikuma and Mogami and uh, I don't no one has any photos of the damage done to any of the aircraft carriers but to give you an idea of what that might have been like here's what the Mikuma looked like not long before it sank. Now 
Fast forward to uh, 1999, and my company, Nauticos, was interested in trying to find one of the ships from this battle. Now, by then, uh, Dr. Ballard had already found the Yorktown, and we were keen to locate some of the Japanese ships. It turns out that the Nautilus made an attack on the Kaga, one of those three ships that were sunk shortly before it sunk. They didn't sink right away, by the way. They floated around for many hours and uh, it wasn't until that evening that, that those three sunk. Um, and so by knowing where the Nautilus was when it observed Kaga sinking, we could calculate where to go search for, for Kaga, which by the way was quite a distance from where it was recorded to have been sunk in the World War II records. So we teamed up with the Naval Oceanographic Office and in 1999 we set sail on the Sumner with equipment that could search at these depths which uh, approach 17,000 feet. Now, uh, this is probably a good time for a little show and tell. One of the characteristics of water that deep is the pressure. Uh, as, as you know, if you've ever dived in even in a swimming pool, the pressure increases pretty quickly and you can feel it on your ears. And in fact, it's one atmosphere for every 100 feet of depth. So 17,000 feet, the pressure is massive. We're talking about more than 6,000 pounds per square inch. A scuba bottle would crush from the outside. So we like to demonstrate that fact and, 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 and have a little fun with it and get a souvenir by taking a uh, kind of a standard styrofoam cup like this one, coffee cup and decorating it, writing your name or putting a logo on, and then putting it with our equipment as it goes down, and the air is all crushed out of it by the pressure, and what you get is a little, little styrofoam thimble that uh, you can still read all the writing on it. I'm gonna pass this around. You're welcome to handle it. It's not particularly fragile, but I do, I do want it back. This particular one went down um, in, in 2002 when we were searching for Amelia Earhart's plane, it went down to uh, about 18,000 feet deep. So not too many people get to handle something that's been down to that depth. Of course, the equipment has to be built to withstand and operate at that depth. Uh, a few shots from our expedition. This is actually a vintage photo of Midway Island taken during the war. And uh, this is another one, a famous one. Uh, showing the, uh, the damage done by the Japanese attack as well as the, the birds that call Midway their home. It's a huge uh, uh, bird nesting island. Uh, I believe there are something like 800,000 nesting pairs of birds that call Midway their home. When we went there in 1999, the, most of the birds had left, and, but it was still pretty crowded <laughs> and they were everywhere. Uh, Midway today is a bird sanctuary. When we went there in 1999, one of the islands was completely off limits due to fish and wildlife uh, rules. The other one had a uh, r small remainder of the, of the World War II installation. The, the BOQ was turned into a small um, motel and there was one restaurant and a couple of buildings they called the Midway Mall which had a bowling alley and a little, a little dis, uh, uh, a couple little shops. And it was, uh, they had a couple of flights from Honolulu a week that would go there. And it was mainly visited by uh, uh, veterans that wanted to see the battle and folks like us to see the site of the battle, fishermen, uh, divers, and wildlife people. Um, now I understand it's, it's pretty much closed for the time being to anyone. But uh, there wasn't much there. This is kind of tongue-in-cheek called the Reef Hotel and Casino. It consisted of a floating uh, barge with an awning and a couple of kayaks. That was it. Um, but it was really interesting to go see the island and imagine what had gone on there those years before. So here's the equipment that we used in our search. This uh, system was built by the, uh, for the Naval Oceanographic Office. And you can see these big heavy, thick bottles everywhere that hold the, in, the um, electronics to keep them from the pressure. In the front are lights and cameras, and on the side, the little red bar is a sonar projector, so we could use sonar, just like Nautilus did in World War II, to try to detect something on the bottom and find targets we were looking for. Uh, uh, there was a, it was a lot roomier inside our workspace than I'm sure it was in the Nautilus. 
And uh, after our, our successful search, there's a very young Dave Jordan in the middle there, we, uh, uh, we were grateful to work with the Naval, the, uh, Naval Oceanographic Office and at the same time we were frustrated because they could only spare a few days time and we were quite uh, pleased to be able to find what we were looking for in, in such a short amount of time. What did we find? Well we found a lot of wreckage. The Kaga was hit by many bombs and it burned for many hours. As I mentioned it was built on a battleship hull so the hull didn't want to sink, but the rest of the ship just eroded away and fell off in bits and pieces. And this particular piece was, was uh, one of the more interesting ones. It's about the size of this room, and it contained a couple of anti-aircraft batteries on it. And it also had this landing light array, which, which stuck out from the side and helped the pilots land. And it was particularly interesting to us because it was unique to that ship, so we knew we had found the ship we were looking for. Uh, some other bits of wreckage, there's a, a bell. It's not big enough to be the ship's bell, but it's probably from a launch uh, on the ship. We, we weren't able to or didn't intend to recover anything. Lots of stuff on the bottom. This is one of my uh, favorite shots. Uh, this shows three things. The deep sea out there in that part of the world is covered with these little nodules there between golf ball and softball size of pure manganese and some of the ocean mining efforts over the years have have uh, endeavored to try to scoop them up as a as a resource uh, it, it's certainly been done and possible it's just kind of expensive uh, the the worm trail on the upper right shows you that even at that great depth there's a lot of creatures living down there and I'll show you more about that in a minute and then, of course, the Japanese sailor's boot is left over there from the carnage that, that happened at that, that time during the war. Um, when, we were, uh, when we finished looking over, over the whole night at the video of the bottom, several of us sat at the side of the deck as the sun was rising and the sea was calm and peaceful to kind of toast our success. Uh, Navy ships are, are dry, but someone had smuggled a little bit of uh, vodka on board, and so we had a little toast. And uh, I'm not saying who, it wasn't me. And we started reflecting over the circumstances and thinking about that calm and peaceful sea and what it must have been like uh, back in 1942 with men in the water and planes crashing and bombs exploding and, and, and the twisted wreckage that we saw on the bottom. It was, it was quite a feeling. Anyway, um, I'll tell you very briefly, I was hoping to be able to show you more images of this wreckage with better, newer, high-resolution cameras. And in fact, we, we were poised to return to the site back in April with, the, with NOAA, who was planning to do some work in the, in the marine sanctuary of the Northwest Pacific Islands. And they had agreed to give us two days uh, of imaging with high-def cameras in the site of the Battle of Midway, which is just up in the upper left corner of this picture. Well, um, and so we were very excited and we said, well, here's the maps that we did and here's where we think wreckage is and here's a target to look at and we, we were really looking to get a lot more of, of data from this uh, and, and maybe even find some of the historical vintage aircraft that were, were sunk there. And this is the ship. Um, some of you, this, we were actually going to operate out of the Inner Space Center right down the road at URI, so as some of you here may know about that. They actually communicate everything back home by telepresence, so that big ball on the top is a satellite dish which is gimbaled so that regardless of the motion of the ship it still points at the satellite and they can send high bandwidth video back home. So we could actually go at the center or even on our home computers and li literally conference call with the scientists on board. So we had 30 scientists uh, working with the two that were on the ship and seeing real time and helping to direct what the what the ROV was seeing, the robotic vehicle down uh, at the bottom. And here's what uh, sort of things they found. Uh, it was an incredible uh, uh, cameras that, that captured these amazing creatures that are down there, in, in some cases uh, as deep as 4,000 meters or 12, 13,000 feet deep. Uh, 
This one is kind of cool. This is, if you have any of your scuba divers, you may have seen sea cucumbers, which are kind of dark gray, black blobs on the bottom. This is a sea cucumber free swimming, going along like this, with transparent skin, so you can see its insides. A lot of weird critters down there. And, and one of the most exciting ones was this one here. You may have seen him on the news. Beautiful, I'm not sure. Different than the two we got on video last year. That animal is not in the hurl, guys. Uh, yeah. The moral words of Taylor Smith. I have never, like, ever seen that one. <laughs> Excellent. This turns out to be a undiscovered, unknown species of octopus that's living down there at uh, 13,000 feet below the surface. And you can see how good these cameras are compared to what we had to work with back in the... So he, he made the news. He was named Casper, of course. <laughs> now, of course, the problem with uh, working in the ocean is you got to deal with weather. And uh, there's where we were hoping to get our uh, dives in, and that was what the, w the, the weather looked like. Turns out that I wish they had checked with me because I had done some studies, and, and March, February, March were the worst times to try to operate in that part of the world, and our dives were, were canceled. So, but you know, we, we're on, on the list to go back, so I hope to be able to bring you back some better imagery in the future. But before I close, I wanted to say a few more words about the Nautilus. Um, and the remarkable crew that manned that ship. The Nautilus was, as I say, on its first war patrol. No one had ever been to battle before of the 93 men on board. Um, they went on to do 14 patrols during the course of the war, and actually it being one of the oldest ships in the fleet was uh, decommissioned and scrapped before the end of the war, so never sunk by, by the enemy. This is Bill Brockman. He was a remarkable fellow. He, um, as I said, on his first patrol, uh, this is when he's receiving the Navy Cross for heroism at Midway. Navy Cross is the highest award, highest honor the Navy can bestow. It's second only to the Medal of Honor. Bill won three of them over the course of his career. And he is, uh, this is November 1942. I believe he was 36 or 38 at that time. He looks a little older than that, I think. but. Um, and he was a remarkable leader, and I judge that by, of the uh, seven officers of the Nautilus, six of them became commanders of their own submarine. And one of the NCOs, the uh, chief of the boat, was eventually commissioned and became a submarine captain. Uh, the only one that didn't was killed in action before he had a chance. Uh, also, three of the wardroom became admirals by the end of the war. So that's a pretty remarkable uh, tally. Um, and I'm going to, oh, of course, uh, Bill Brockman retired as an admiral, the rear admiral at the end of the war, and he went on to have a successful career in the chemical industry after, back in Baltimore, where he was from. And he also did a little, uh, a little promotional work. Here he is standing for an ad for Camel Cigarettes. <laughs> In 24 years, I've tried them all. Nothing beats Camels for flavor. <laughs> and he has his Nautilus pin and, and submarine in front of him and, and all that. How old was he when he died? Um, uh, it's, I'd have to check. It's in the book. He, uh, he, he lived to be uh, into his 80s, I believe, but I'd have to check that. I, I met recently, after I published the book, his nephew, uh, Larry Brockman called me and he said the family was really grateful that I had written the book he said because we knew Uncle Bill was a war hero but he never really talked about it and so I had a, a lot of information and reports eyewitness uh, interviews with other crew members about him he did talk about his cigarettes though. that's right yeah <laughs> I don't know if that contributed um, a couple of other of the wardroom, and I won't take too much more time, but I wanted to mention a few of these other heroes of the Nautilus. Uh, uh, Pat Rooney, who was the first lieutenant, uh, became, after he left Nautilus, he became the commander of the Corvina. And the Corvina is famous, uh, not in a good way, as uh, being the only 
U.S. submarine to have been sunk by a Japanese submarine during World War II. And uh, that was on his first patrol as commander of the Corvina. And he was one of the 20% of American submariners that were lost during the war. This fellow, who was uh, the, the torpedo and gunnery officer, Ozzie Lynch, was a really interesting guy. He was a camera enthusiast, and he actually had his own still camera and 16 millimeter movie camera. And he brought them on board with him, and he actually figured out how to hook them up to the periscope, and he made, uh, he took videos, or not videos, but film, and still photos through the cameras, and in fact he was, on one of their subsequent patrols, he was assigned to collect imagery of the island of Tarawa in advance of the invasion. The cameras that were sent by the Navy didn't work, so he used his own cameras and, and he got the imagery. Uh, later, Nautilus, after the Battle of Midway, came back to, to port at Midway, did a couple of days refurbishment and headed back out to continue their first war patrol. And during that, they sank the uh, destroyer Yamakaze, and Ozzy took this photo of its sinking, which made the um, photo of the year for Life magazine. And uh, many of you have probably seen this photo. It's not always accurately attributed, but uh, Ozzy Lynch took it. Um, I, I met his uh, daughter, Peggy, um, who lives in New Orleans, and back when we were doing this project, and she shared with me three VHS tapes of, of Ozzy's film. And they included shots like this, torpedoes hitting um, uh, targets, um, images of Pearl Harbor during VA day, or VJ day, um, the crew doing calisthenics on the deck, really cool stuff. Some of it is on YouTube, but a lot of it isn't. And so when I was writing the book, I said, you know, I wanted to re look at these tapes again, but I said to myself, I'm not going to look at them before I digitize them and put them on DVD, because then that way they'll be preserved. So I did that, and I called Peggy, and I said what I did, and I said, number one, I'd be happy to give you a copy, and number two, uh, if you can give me the original 16 millimeter film, I think today we can do a better job of, of converting these. And she said, well, I can't, because I'm sorry to say they were all lost in Katrina. So um, I may have had the only copy at that point. So she asked me to make copies for her sisters and I was happy to do that. Uh, here is another fellow I wanted to mention briefly. Uh, Raleigh DeFries was the junior officer on board. He was the commissary officer. And he came from a great uh, naval background. His father was an admiral, quite old by World War II, but he had been a hero in World War I. And he was an up-and-coming young officer. He was supposed to have been, he was class of 42 at the Naval Academy, so he should have been at graduation ceremonies in June of 1942, but they graduated that class a year early, so he was actually in the Battle of Midway instead of throwing his hat up at graduation. <laughs> um, he, he went on to join um, the Sculpin as a lieutenant, and the Sculpin is also infamous because it was involved in, a, in an attack where it was depth charged and they lost depth control and accidentally came to the surface and they were damaged uh, by, the, uh, by the Japanese destroyer and unable to submerge. The captain sent his gunners and officers to the topside to try to fend off the Japanese ship and as soon as they got up in place, the uh, Japanese uh, hit them accurately in the conning tower and killed everybody topside, including 23-year-old DeFries. Um, now, the rest of that story, so he's the only one that didn't become a commander, and I, I imagine he would have if he had survived. Uh, the, other, the rest of that story is also on board the submarine was the Wolfpack commander, Joe, uh, John Cromwell the uh, squadron commander, and they had a wolf pack of three submarines. And at this point, the ship was helpless, and the captain decided that there was no choice but to abandon ship. So he, he ordered that. There were 42 men that got off. But Cromwell said to himself, gee, I know two very important secrets. He knew about the upcoming invasion of Tarawa, and he also knew about the 
uh, code breaking secret, which was the best kept secret of the war. He did not want to be captured by the Japanese and he feared that he would be tortured into telling them something. So he chose to stay on board and go down with the ship. Uh, of the 42 that escaped, 21 of them actually made it through prisoner of war camp and to the end of the war. And they reported about Joseph or John Cromwell's heroism and he was given the Medal of Honor posthumously for that. So one other fellow, uh, the last one I'll mention is uh, Buzz Lee. He's the guy that uh, we have quite a bit of information from. He, he gave us uh, hours and hours of audio uh, interviews. And one of his shipmates, uh, Red Porterfield, the chief of the boat, said that, that Buzz really liked to tell a tale and he thought he even believed some of them. <laughs> so I tried not to rely on, on Buzz for facts, but I did rely on him for feelings. And, uh, yeah. and I substantiated what he said with, 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 with logs and records, and, uh, and that worked out fine. Um, here is Buzz as a uh, young first-class radio man being awarded the unit citation that Nautilus received uh, as a result of its uh, uh, success at the Battle of Midway uh, by Admiral Nimitz. So uh, Buzz unfortunately has passed away, as have uh, just about everybody from the crew. I'm not aware of any surviving members of the crew that were on the Battle of Midway, although there are some that still survive from the Nautilus later. And I'm going to be giving much the same talk at the Army-Navy Club in Arlington next Friday night uh, for the annual Midway commemoration, which I'm very honored to do. Um, so that's my story. There is a book that details this, and uh, I understand they have it here at the museum um, uh, store. And I'll be happy if there's a few more minutes to answer any questions. Thank you. Yes, there is one in the middle here. Did the uh, Nautilus ever find a good advantage for the six-inch guns? That's a really, really interesting question because in, um, I have in the back of the book a little synopsis of their 14 patrols because I thought it was kind of interesting. They did some really amazing stuff. In the, the subsequent patrol after, uh, I believe it was the very next one or maybe the one after, they uh, took Carlson's Raiders, uh, the Marine Battalion, and to make an island, which was an island near Tarawa. And they actually uh, provided fire support to the Marines by shelling installations and, and some small ships that tried to oppose them. So they did use their guns. They were with the Narwhal, which had similar uh, equipment on board. Uh, unfortunately, the raiders had to be evacuated. Um, they they uh, you know, weren't, were successful in that they pretty much wiped out the Japanese that were there, but then the counterattack caused them to, to have to retire. Um, Franklin Roosevelt's son was uh, an officer in that, in that group and was on board Nautilus. They also were asked, not asked, you don't ask in the Navy, the, um, but Bill Brockman took it that way. Uh, Admiral English, who was in charge of the submarine fleet, had kind of a wild plan. They, they had intelligence that said the emperor was going to be at his summer quarters uh, on the coast and he wanted to send Nautilus on, on their patrol inland to shell the palace. And Brockman said, no. He said, it's you know, too dangerous, uh, we'll never get out of there alive, and he talked him out of it. Uh, actually, I, I think the way it went was he just didn't do it. You know, he went out on his patrol and he didn't, you know, and, and no one thought less of him for it. He was actually uh, very, uh, he became a uh, squadron commander and, and commanded another submarine and commanded a, 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 an oiler later in the war. Uh, those are two particular instances that I know of that they used them. Oh, oh one other thing. The uh, submarine darter was damaged uh, uh, and abandoned and the Nautilus was assigned to go destroy it. And so they shelled it with their guns until it broke apart. So yes, they did use them. <laughs> Uh, yes, over here. Uh, I, I was of the understanding that the Nautilus <coughs> used their guns that were more effective, well, let me say this. They sank a lot of shipping, but most of it was sunk 
by the guns. And I was also astounded to realize that they've got, they had a six inch gun. I assume that was fixed ammunition. Yeah, it's, there were two, two six inch yeah. cannon on board, yeah. Do you know anything about that? Uh, I know that they, that they did routinely use their gun. The torpedoes were not effective, plus they, you know, they could only carry so many. They were a very you know, valuable weapon to, to use. So if they could, I, I don't think they were atypical, but they had bigger guns than any other submarine in the, fle in the fleet. Uh, so I couldn't tell you how many ships they sunk by one. Now, of course, later in the war, the torpedoes became, they fixed the problem and they became much more effective. There was one in the back there. Yeah. Uh, in your book, do you detail the at least two U.S. personnel who were picked up by the Arashi? Yes, uh, there's a, there were a couple of instances that, that were, um, uh, one was prosecuted as a war crime, the other, the other wasn't. Um, but there were uh, two sets of U.S. aviators that were tortured and killed, executed. Uh, one of them was, it's really an interesting story, um, one of them was by the captain of the Rashi. And um, Ensign Osmus was the name of the pilot, and um, I'm sorry, I don't remember the name of his gunner. But they were tortured into giving information about the U.S. fleet, and then they were, uh, uh, they were killed with a fire axe. Actually, um, it was Osmus that was hit with a fire axe and basically decapitated and thrown overboard. It was just him in that case with Arashi. There were two other sail, uh, aviators that were picked up by another ship, and they were simply had weights tied to their feet and thrown overboard. Um, Oh, Flaherty, right. And there's very good. Yeah, thank you for remembering. Fly Southwest Airlines and go through Midway Airport in Chicago. You'll see the Midway exhibit, and you'll see their names uh, commemorated there. Flaherty and Guido, so they won't be forgotten. Very good. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for reminding me of their names. And there was a ship named for Flaherty as well. Um, there's also a more to the story about the uh, Arashi and um, the captain. He was also involved in the sinking of the PT-109, um, the ship that he was the squadron commander of. And um, he was subsequently sunk and, and killed by uh, an American submarine after that. So there was some justice in his case, at least. About how many submarines did we have actively fighting it during the Battle of Midway? Um, there were... I believe there were 11 that were in kind of a picket line, and there was a, a 12th, the um, cachalot that was farther out, and then there were others at, like up in the Aleutians and, and different places, but there was, there was about a dozen. The Japanese have about the same number? The Japanese submarines were, uh, this, in terms of, if you look at the order of battle, yes, and, and it's in the book, they're, they're roughly equal numbers. The, the Japanese submarines had almost no impact on the battle except one very major one, and that the submarine I-158, uh, or 168, same number as the Nautilus by coincidence, was the one that put the final touch on sinking the Yorktown. Um, and uh, that, that submarine escaped. But the others d didn't have any impact in the battle. Uh, yes, another... You mentioned the <coughs> submarines that... Uh, didn't make it. Uh, how, how many submarines in the uh, Pacific area were there? Well, um, I know there were 50 that were sunk, and it depends on what time of the, what part of the war you're looking at as to how many were active at any one time. Um, and I don't know off the top of my head the number total that were built. It was several hundred, but I, I, don't, I don't know. Uh, certainly, the rate of attrition for uh, the U.S. submarine forces was, was terrible but it was nothing compared to the U-boats uh, or the Japanese forces. Almost all the Japanese submarines that were operating were sunk. <laughs> Three quarters of them were sunk and the other quarter were, were really not in operation. So it was, it was worse on that end. Yes? I understand that uh, during World War II, an American submarine got into Tokyo Bay and they watched the construction being completed on a you know, Japanese ship. And when they launched it, they torpedoed it. Yeah, I think you're referring to what was the Shinano, which was a 
um, as you may know, there were, there were two super battleships that um, Japan built, the Yamato and the Musashi, and these carried the 18-inch cannon, the biggest naval guns in the, ever. And they had a third one that was being built, and they decided to convert it to a super aircraft carrier, and they called it the Shinano. And that was, that was torpedoed <coughs> on its way, just as you said, from in the middle of new construction after it was launched, just after it was launched. I also understand during the, the 30s, maybe earlier, that they uh, had a British design company design a battleship or some sort of a military vessel. And when they, uh, they didn't pay the bill, so when they launched it, they had built into it, uh, the metacentric height was a bit off. <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> clever, clever. <laughs> Any other questions? We have a couple more minutes. There's one, another one in the back there. Uh, sadly, the Hammond U.S. destroyer yes. was in the cordon around Yorktown. Correct. Took a torpedo from I-168, and unfortunately, because it was submarine, the depth charge uh, <coughs> depth charges weren't put up on safety. So when she sank, the depth uh, <coughs> charges exploded and killed many of the crew. <coughs> Did you, uh, or have you ever thought of going after the Hammond? Um, the, we have not because it's really in a completely different area and it would be near the Yorktown, um, but that would be an interesting thing to search for. Um, I think the, the, the four, th at least three of the four Japanese carriers would be kind of our main targets because they're, we know, we really do know pretty well where they are. It was just a question of having enough time to, to, to complete the search and, and, and investigate the battlefield. What I'd also really like to find is the, the site of the actual air battles themselves and the torpedo plane attacks because uh, resting on the seafloor there are the remains of Torpedo Squadron 8 and the other uh, Devastator torpedo bombers which were lost there, as I said, decimated, literally, and um, there are no surviving copies of a de Devastator torpedo bomber anywhere in the world on dry land. There's, there's one that was lost in, in one of the Great Lakes for training. It's sitting there, but there's none of the ones that fought in the war have ever been recovered. So it would be awfully historic to find one of those, and in particular if we could find George Gay's plane, the survivor, sole survivor of Torpedo Squadron 8. Uh, that plane was ditched. It wasn't exploded or anything. It, it ought to be in <laughs> In, in good condition, but uh, that would be my, my uh, dream scenario to, to have a chance to find that. Yes? The, the, do you guys work with the Japanese, with Japan at all on these uh, voyages? In, in, this, in this particular case, it was very indirectly. Um, we did do a documentary on this uh, show that was shown on, on our expedition that was on Discovery Channel back in 2000, uh, but the Japanese NHK and, and other were, were not interested. Uh, there was not a lot of interest in this. After all, it was their biggest defeat of the beginning of the war. Um, and we have some, still some loose connections to the Japanese. And if we get to go out on expedition again, we'll certainly bring those back to life. And if they're interested, then we'll, you know, we'll be happy to, to participate, have them participate. So I think my uh, time is up. I'll be happy to stay and talk to anyone that wants to for as long as you want. Yes, Bob. Would you consider coming back sometime and tell us about your uh, successful search for the, uh, the car? Uh, sure, I'll be happy to. Uh, Can you just tell the audience for a second what that is? Yeah, the Dakar you said? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, the, the first book uh, I published was about the discovery of the Israeli submarine Dakar. It's a pretty interesting story. Back in 1968, Israel bought uh, three submarines from England, World War II vintage subs, and the first one was delivered successfully this, right during the Six Day War, just after it. And the second one was on its way from Portsmouth, England, where it had been re refitted to Haifa and it disappeared in the middle of the Mediterranean, almost exactly where, by the way, the Egypt airplane went down, was last seen, anyway, last heard from. Um, that's a coincidence, I'm sure, but it's interesting because it's the deepest part of the Mediterranean. And in 1999, actually the same time we were doing this expedition, we had another team 
searching in the med and we found uh, Dakar and it had sunk in 10,000 feet of water and it, it, it sunk by an accident, we determined, and it actually imploded. So it was a mass of wreckage. We were able to recover the conning tower, uh, which is a four ton piece of metal that had detached from the uh, ship. And that is now a memorial to the 69 sailors that disappeared on, on Dakar. But it was a pretty interesting story because we, we um, uh, after 30 years, that they were continuing to search for this. A lot of it was because of the families of the 69 and wanting to know what happened. It's sort of like the Malaysian airliner, and I'm sure we'll see something similar from Egypt Air, where the families really want to know what happened. Long after the, you know, the, the Navy cares anymore because they're not using that kind of ship design and what are they going to learn from it, but uh, the, f the families can keep it up for, for a long time. And it was very poignant to be able to meet with them afterwards and to see the gratitude for the closure that they got from knowing what happened. So, it's a, so there's a lot to the story and I'd be happy to come back and tell it someday. Thank you. <laughs>